I hope that you'll turn with me in a Bible to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 21. And we'll be looking together at verses 17 to 29. 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 17 to 29. In following the story of God's prophet Elijah, we meet again with someone who by now should be a familiar character, and that is King Ahab. King Ahab, king of the northern kingdom of Israel. He reigned in the 9th century B.C., 800s B.C. And we've seen his antagonism toward the Lord. We've seen how he's brought into Israel the worship of false gods, the worship of idols. We've seen his marriage to Jezebel and how that marriage to Jezebel ushered in all kinds of wickedness among God's people. And we've seen how the prophet Elijah has confronted him about this sin. And we've seen how it seems to have had zero effect upon him. Well, when we come to chapter 21, we find that Ahab is in his palace, in the capital city of Samaria. And he looks out, and he sees his neighbor's vineyard. His neighbor's name was Naboth. And he looks out upon this vineyard, and he thinks to himself, that's a nice vineyard. I think I'd like to have that vineyard. We're not told why this vineyard is so appealing, but, you know, sometimes the grass is just greener. So he makes what he believes is a fair offer to Naboth. He says, Here, here's what I'll do, Naboth. I'll give you another vineyard, just as good. And if you don't want that, then I'll pay you a fair price for your vineyard. Naboth says, no way. This is land that was allotted to my family by God. How could I give up what has belonged to my ancestors for generations? So Ahab turns away, dejected, downcast. He wants that vineyard so bad. And he's so distraught that he stops eating. His wife Jezebel comes to him and says, what's wrong, Ahab? And he tells his story of woe. That Naboth won't give me his vineyard. I offered a fair price. I offered to even give him another vineyard if he would take that. And he won't give me anything. Jezebel responds and says, well, are, are you king of Israel or what? And as we've seen before, Ahab is the passive one in this relationship. Jezebel says, I'll get you that vineyard. So she sends out letters in Ahab's name with his seal upon it to various elders and leaders in Israel who lived near Naboth, and she summons them to a fast. And a fast is something that the people of Israel held whenever there was a calamity, whenever disaster struck. We need to gather, we need to renounce food and the pleasures of life, and we need to focus on God and what God would have us to do. We need to repent if there's something we need to repent of. So she says, schedule a fast. And at this fast, seat two scoundrels opposite to Naboth, and have those scoundrels bring charges against Naboth. Have them bear false witness against him to say that this calamity has come. We're having this fast because Naboth has blasphemed, because Naboth has cursed God and the king. And we're not sure exactly why she holds such sway over these elders and leaders in Israel, but she does. She's Jezebel. And they comply without question or hesitation. And they do exactly as she said. They have a fast. They accuse Naboth of blasphemy. 
of cursing God and the king. Notice how Jezebel is willing to acknowledge God when it's convenient. The rest of the time, she's a worshiper of Baal, the false god. And it goes exactly according to plan. They haul out Naboth, they stone him to death, and there's nothing standing in the way of Ahab possessing Naboth's vineyard. He gets it, and he goes to take possession of it. And Jezebel goes to tell him the good news. Get up and take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the the Jezreelite, that he refused to sell to you. He is no longer alive, but dead. We win, Ahab. Just go take what I've purchased for you. Now, does this move you to any indignation? Does this provoke some anger in you? Does this make you think, is he going to get away with this injustice? With this wickedness? Where is God? Why is he allowing Ahab and Jezebel to triumph over this poor man Naboth who just didn't want to sell his vineyard for good reason. Where's God? Is that your reaction when you see injustice and wickedness and evil in this world? What should move you? And that's by God's created design in us. He's given us a conscience, and our conscience is to be sensitive to what is right and what is wrong. And to the extent that it's not, it shows the hardness of our hearts, and it shows how our consciences can become callous over time so that we can't differentiate between what is right and what is wrong. So we should be moved to anger and indignation at wickedness and evil and sin and injustice. This should move us. We should be affected by this. We should say, what is going to happen? He can't get away with this. This is wrong. But that should not be our only response. By God's grace, we should read this, and we should see God's response And we should be moved to praise him for his mercy. We should be moved to praise him for his mercy. And we should be moved by his grace to repent of our own sinfulness in the face of this. This is what we should be moved to do by God's grace whenever we face injustice or evil or sin. So take just a moment and think about something in your life that's not right. And you say, where was God in that? Why did God let this happen? Why did the wicked seem to be prospering in this circumstance? Bring that before this scripture. And may the Holy Spirit work in us. So let's read together about God's response here so that we might praise him for his mercy and repent of our own sinfulness. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, the Tishbite. Go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now in Naboth's vineyard, where he has gone to take possession of it. Say to him, this is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Then say to him, this is what the Lord says. In the place where dogs licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up your blood. Yes, yours. Ahab said to Elijah, so you have found me, my enemy. I have found you, he answered, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. He says, I am going to bring disaster on you. I will wipe out your descendants and cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, 
son of Nabat, and that of Baasha, son of Ahijah, because you have aroused my anger and have caused Israel to sin. And also concerning Jezebel, the Lord says, dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Dogs will eat those belonging to Ahab who die in the city, and the birds will feed on those who die in the country. There was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. He behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols, like the Amorites the Lord drove out before Israel. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. This may seem like an odd scripture on which to preach God's mercy, but it's here. It's here in abundance. God's kindness, his patience, and his mercy toward sinners. And we all have a tendency to underestimate God's mercy toward sinners. We need to understand what we read in passages like Romans 2.4, that his kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Or 2 Peter 3, 9, he doesn't, he's not slow as we think of slowness. He's patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but for all to have eternal life. Or how about Ezekiel 18, verse 23? He doesn't take delight or pleasure in the death of the wicked. Even Ahab, he doesn't take delight in this. This is a merciful, patient, kind God. Do you realize that? And to understand his mercy, we need to see how you can run. You can run from God, but you cannot, you cannot hide your sins will find you out one way or another. You cannot hide. His eyes range throughout the world, keeping watch over the good and the evil. As we read in Proverbs 15, verse 3. But if that's true, if his judgment is so certain, then why didn't he intervene sooner? Why does Naboth have to get stoned to death before God sends his prophet Elijah to intervene and call him out? Why does he allow sinners to run so far, to get away with so much? Why? That's the question. Because he's being merciful even to Ahab, merciful. And with mercy upon mercy, with each evidence of it, he is proving his justice, proving his mercy. He's leaving sinners, he's leaving you, he's leaving me without excuse. No one can say, I didn't get a chance when we understand rightly his mercy. So how do we see his mercy on display here? We see the mercy of repetition. We see the mercy of repetition. And we see this in the fact that he sends his prophet Elijah to Ahab again, again. The mercy of repetition. And we have to wonder, how many chances does Ahab get? 
how many chances, how many opportunities. But do you see God's mercy in this? He knows how stubborn we are. He knows how hardened our hearts can become. And still, he sends his prophet to speak the truth. We've seen how Ahab was confronted by Elijah in the time of drought and famine when Elijah came to him and said, it's not going to rain again except at my word. And this is judgment upon your sinfulness because you have brought in the worship of idols because you chose to marry Jezebel out of political expediency because you thought that making an alliance with Sidon and their people and their gods would benefit you. So you have brought this judgment on your own people. You are a bad shepherd, a bad king. All of that is bundled into God's judgment that he spoke through Elijah, his prophet, earlier. And is Ahab moved by that? Remember what Ahab's thinking about in the time of famine? Is he worried about his people who are starving and dying? No. Remember what he's worried about? Maybe we should find some grass for my horses. Because without my horses, I can't go in my chariot. And if I can't go in my chariot, then what kind of king am I? You remember this? And so he sends out messengers to try to find where there's still grass in the land so that his horses can eat and be filled. <laughs> Never mind his people. Surely that would bring God's immediate judgment upon him. But it doesn't. God is so merciful. He repeats the warning again. Elijah confronts him, and what does he say to Elijah? Oh, there you are, you troubler of Israel. And Elijah says, I'm not the troubler, you are. I'm not the problem, you are. But to prove that the Lord is God, that he alone is God, we're going to have a showdown, a contest. You remember the scene on Mount Carmel? Elijah says, let the prophets of Baal see if they can get Baal to respond by fire. And after they've had their turn, then I will call upon the Lord to see if he will respond by fire. And we know how this goes. Baal is silent because Baal isn't real. But the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. He responds with fire from heaven. And the people are moved to repeat it over and over again. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Ahab witnesses all of this. Is he moved? No. Elijah goes to him and says, get up, eat and drink. Rains are coming. Times of refreshing are coming. And so he gets up and he eats and he drinks. Does he acknowledge the Lord in any way? No. Does he say thank you? No. He gets up and he eats and he drinks. But Elijah prays for the rains to come, and they do come. He sees the abundance of God's provision. Is Ahab moved by this? No. What does he do? Elijah tells him to go back to Jezreel. He does. And what does he do when he gets there? He tells Jezebel, you won't believe what Elijah did. Not what God did. You won't believe what Elijah did. And Jezebel, of course, as Jezebel does, is moved to anger and vengeance, and she seeks for Elijah's life. She tries to kill him, and so Elijah's on the run. This Ahab, this Ahab, and if you go back to the previous chapter, chapter 20, you see how the Lord actually gives Ahab victory over his enemies to the north in Syria, also known as Aram. He gives Ahab victory instead of striking him dead. Do you see the mercy of repetition? How God warns him over and over and over and over and over again. Have you seen that mercy in your own life? It's there. It's there. Especially for those of us who show up on the Lord's day and sit under the preaching of God's word. We're reminded over and over and over again. How many Lord's Days will it take? How many sermons will it take? How many Bible studies will it take to move you, to move me, 
How long will it take? The mercy of repetition. We need to understand this because it helps us understand why it seems like the wicked prosper. We need to understand that our timeline is not God's timeline. From God's timeline, they don't last. This is what we read in Job 20, verse 4. Surely you know how it has been from of old, ever since mankind was placed on the earth, that the mirth of the wicked is brief. The mirth, the happiness, the laughter of the wicked is brief. The joy of the godless lasts but a moment. Though the pride of the godless person reaches to the heavens and his head touches the clouds, he will perish forever like his own dung. Those who have seen him will say, where is he? Like a dream he flies away, no more to be found, banished like a vision of the night. The eye that saw him will not see him again. His place will look on him no more. That's the word of God. It doesn't last. So when it seems like the wicked are prospering, when it seems like they're triumphant, when it seems like God is absent, remember his mercy of repetition. He's giving them opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Praise him for his mercy and repent. Look within your own heart. Look within your own life to see how many chances has he given you Well, then we see the mercy of confrontation. The mercy of confrontation. You have to appreciate this scene. Ahab has what he's wanted. He has the vineyard of Naboth. All he has to do is go take possession of it. So you imagine Ahab riding in his glorious chariot probably. And you imagine where his mind is. He's thinking of all the wonderful things he can do with this vineyard. He's thinking of how favor has been shown to him. He's thinking, wow, think of all the wealth I can accumulate for myself. Think of all the comforts I can enjoy. Don't I have a fine wife, Jezebel, to get this for me? And then, bam, who meets him? Elijah. <laughs> Elijah. And Elijah has the word of the Lord for him. But look at what Ahab's answer to him is. So you have found me, my enemy. <laughs> Elijah, you would show up right now. You would show up. Why is it you're such a killjoy? You're such a wet blanket. Can't I just savor this vineyard for just a minute? I just got it. Can I have a minute to enjoy it? And here you are, my enemy. And Elijah says, you bet I've found you. You've sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. Did you really think you could get away with this? Ahab, you can run, but you can't hide from God. He's seen all of this. And he's shown you mercy through all of this. By warning you time and time again. And now he's showing you mercy by confronting you. By confronting you, by confronting you to expose your sinfulness, to show you the error of your ways. But remember this. This is how the world and the people of this world will respond to you when you call out what is sinful and wicked. They'll call you an enemy and worse. Think of the words of the Apostle Paul in Galatians 4, verse 16. Have I now become your enemy for telling you the truth? Have I now become your enemy for telling you the truth? Paul saying, I love you, Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Christ was preached as crucified. You knew 
Because you were taught faithfully that salvation is in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. Who has now told you that it's by your own efforts that you could somehow earn God's favor? That's a lie. That's a false gospel. If anybody preaches a gospel other than the gospel of grace, let them be accursed even if an angel preaches it. Have I become your enemy for telling you the truth? And this is what any faithful preacher of the gospel should expect. People don't like to be told that they're sinners. People want the prophets to prophesy smooth things, comfortable things, words that lull us, that stoke our ego, that make us feel better about ourselves, that give us a confidence boost. And this is where Ahab's coming from. Elijah, can't you ever say anything good? Do you always have to ruin my fun? And this is how the world sees it. They think of Christianity as a straitjacket. They think that it's going to limit your joy and your contentment in this life. But nothing can be further from the truth. No, it's your sin that's limiting your joy and your contentment. The wages of sin is death. You'll get what is owed you for your sin. Do you see the mercy of confrontation? It doesn't feel good in the moment. God's discipline never does. But it is always aimed at our good. And it's merciful. He's so gracious to not strike Ahab dead here and now. To not strike me dead here and now to let me continue to get into the pulpit and preach his word. A broken vessel like me. He allows you to keep showing up on the Lord's day, to sit in comfort in a pew when our brothers and sisters around the world, our brothers and sisters in Christ, are persecuted, hunted down, living under fear of death. Do you see his mercy? Are we listening? You can run, but you can't get away from his judgment. It will find you out. Longfellow put it like this. Though the mills of God grind slowly, yet they grind exceedingly small. His judgment is being ground out by the minute. The day of judgment has been set. You can run, but you can't hide. And then, third, notice the mercy of volition. The mercy of volition. There's a phrase that's repeated here. If you look at verse 20, in the words of Elijah, I have found you, he answered, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. And then you see the same phrase in verse 25. There was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. Jesus says in John 8, 34, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. In other words, God hasn't made Ahab do any of this. He chose to do this. He sold himself to do evil. He gave over his life. He gave over his plans. And God lets him. And Romans 1 tells us that this is the form God's wrath can take. He lets us. He gives us over. You want the wages of sin? Have it. You want the misery that comes from having your own way, have it. But I promise you, sin never pays. It never pays. It may give you some temporary fleeting enjoyment, but not in the long run. You'll regret it. You'll regret it, either in this life or in the life to come. The mercy of volition. The Lord gives him over. The Lord lets him and he does. You want to marry Jezebel? Go ahead. See where that gets you. You want to murder a man? 
because you covet his field? You want to steal that which isn't yours? You, you want to cultivate that sinfulness in your heart? You want to nurture that and give it life? You want to feed that, that covetousness? You want to feed lust? You want to feed greed? You want to feed anger? You'll pay for it. You can run, but you can't hide. God sees, God knows. And in his own time and in his own way, he will reveal how you chose that. You can't blame me. He's leaving sinners without excuse. He's leaving Ahab without excuse. And then fourth, we see the mercy of suspension. The mercy of suspension. How so? Well, look at Ahab's response. He hears these words. He tears his clothes. He puts on sackcloth and and he fasts. He lays in the sackcloth and goes about meekly. And the Lord says to Elijah, "Have, have you seen Ahab? Have you seen how he's humbled himself before me? And because he's humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. What is going on here? Are we to believe that Ahab has finally had a change of heart? That God's grace has finally gotten through to him and that that he's a changed man? I don't think so. Here's why. He's not a changed man. This isn't true repentance because of what he doesn't do. Does he go from here and confront Jezebel about her sinfulness? No. He goes on as he has been. Does he seek to make amends with Naboth's family, this man that he is really responsible for having murdered because he coveted after his vineyard? Does he do anything to try to find maybe Naboth's descendants and say, this vineyard is yours, have it. It doesn't belong to me. Does he do anything like Zacchaeus, who climbed up in the sycamore tree to see Jesus, who says, if I have wronged anybody, I'll pay back in full. Two times, three times as much as I've extorted. Does he do anything like that? No. So it doesn't seem to be true repentance based on what he doesn't do. It also doesn't seem to be true repentance based on what he does. In the very next chapter, he and the king of the southern kingdom of Judah team up. The southern king is Jehoshaphat, and they decide to make war against Aram, also known as Syria. And Jehoshaphat says, you know, we should really seek the Lord in this before we make up our minds. And he says, do you have any prophets here? So Ahab says, well, we do have some prophets. So he sends some prophets and asks them, shall I go to war against Ramoth Gilead or shall I refrain? Go, they answer, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat, this is 22.7, is there no longer a prophet of the Lord here whom we can inquire of? Do you see the difference? Ahab has prophets he turns to for guidance and advice. They're just not the Lord's prophets. They're his prophets. But then he says, well, okay, there is one, uh, and this verse is so striking, verse 8. The king of Israel answered Jehoshaphat. This is Ahab. There is still one prophet through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. Now, does this, same, does this sound like a changed man that would say about the Lord's prophet, I hate him because he never prophesies anything good for me but only bad? No. So what's going on here? What seems to be going on is that Ahab is scared. This is what the Apostle Paul refers to as worldly sorrow. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Worldly sorrow versus godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is scared to death. Scared of God's judgment. 
But godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. He's not really afraid of God. He's afraid of his punishment. He doesn't like what has been prophesied about him, that dogs are going to lick his blood. The disgrace of that is more than he can handle. Knowing that his house is about to be wiped out just as God has wiped out the dynasties of those who have gone before him. He doesn't want that, so he tears his clothes. He's scared of judgment. And isn't this the case with many? Facing a grave illness? In the face of war or some other calamity? We get down on our knees and we pray because we're desperate. But after the calamity passes, then we go right back to what we were doing before. And we love our sin just as much as we did before. There's no real change. The prophet Joel says, rend your hearts, not your garments. Rend your hearts, tear your hearts, not your garments. This is mere external. Your heart's not changed. But what do we make of the fact that God does seem to reward even his external remorse, his external humility. If this isn't true repentance, then why does God respond in this way? Because it's the mercy of suspension. He hasn't repealed the judgment. He's just suspended it. I won't bring this in your day, Ahab. You have humbled yourself to some extent. It's, it's merely external. It's merely temporary. I know that. Nevertheless, I'll suspend this judgment. And here's what that means for us. It means if God shows this kind of mercy to someone who at best is showing sham repentance, phony repentance, if God is willing to respond to this kind of repentance, how much more mercy is available to you with true belief and true repentance? Jesus says, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. It's the sick who need a doctor. It's the sick who need a doctor. Do you know your need for his mercy? And can you confess how merciful he has been in your life through repetition, through warning you over and over and over again? Through confrontation, through the word of God showing you, exposing the sin in your heart. Through volition, letting you have your own way. He's let you run, even though you can't hide. And let me tell you right now, we all are the recipients of the mercy of suspension. This world doesn't deserve his mercy. We don't deserve his mercy right now. But our hearts are still beating. We're still breathing. We're still here because of his mercy. Because of his mercy. Do you know your need for his mercy? Well, if you know your need for his mercy, will you repent? Will you turn away from that sin? Whatever it is, is it anger? Is it lust? Is it pride? What is it? Is it self-centeredness? Will you turn away from that to receive his grace? Do you know where to turn? Romans 5, 8 says, but God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were just as stubborn, just as blind, just as hard-hearted as Ahab, Christ died for us. He shed his blood for his people. So will you arise and go to Jesus? Or will you stay stuck? 
all the fitness he requires is that you feel your need of him. That's it. He's not asking you to go fix anything yourself. He's not asking you to get your act together. He's saying, come to Jesus to receive the grace that only he can provide. And through that grace, you will receive true belief and true repentance. Will you come to Jesus for that? Will you confess that he died for you while you were a sinner, while you were lost? Or will you turn away and say, I I don't need that? Or will you merely settle for the external, for the temporary, as though that's good enough? Well, he's kept me alive today. Maybe he'll keep me alive another day. I'll put it off. You haven't persuaded me yet. Or will you say, no, his mercy is available now. I don't know about tomorrow. I'm not guaranteed tomorrow, but I'm alive here. I'm hearing his gospel. I'm hearing his, his good news here and now. I want to repent. I want to leave behind everything and follow him wherever he leads. Is that you today? Come, you sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded by the fall. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love, and power. Will you come to Jesus today? He's so merciful. He's so kind. He's so patient. May we praise him for that as we turn to the Lord in prayer now. Father, it would be so easy for us to read about Ahab and to shake our heads in disgust and to think that we have done so much better. But Lord, your word simply will not allow that. Your word exposes the pride in our own hearts the stubbornness, the resistance, the rebellion in our own hearts. And so, Lord, I pray that in these next few moments that we would open up ourselves to the work of your Holy Spirit, that we would yield, that we would surrender to the work of your Spirit in our lives, and that your Holy Spirit would replace our heart of stone with a heart of flesh, that you would make us more sensitive to your leading, more thankful for your mercy, more committed to live for your glory today and for as long as you give us, Lord. It's all mercy. We don't deserve it, but you are so merciful. You are so patient. You're so kind, Lord. May we never get over it, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.